guys, welcome back to my channel and to episode four of I forgot my own title then. Who done it Wednesday? And today's case is a little bit of a creepy one. This is the case of the weepy voiced killer. This case has been done quite a few times on YouTube before, but I'm gonna do it anyway. And as usual, this is just all the information that I have found online through different sources, which I compiled into one video. This is not meant to disrespect anyone, and I've tried my hardest to make sure all the information is 100% accurate. So with that being said, let's get on to the video. Like I said earlier, today's case is going to be that of the weepy voiced killer. And this is a nickname given to a serial killer who was active in the Twin City area of Minnesota in the early 80s. And the reason he's called the weepy voiced killer is because he he would ring the police after every crime he committed, crying and weeping down the phone, confessing what he'd done. He would give the police information of where to find the body, what he'd done, and then go on to apologize for actually committing the crime. And I will be including the voice recordings of these calls in the video. And they're a little bit creepy to listen to, so that's just to warn you. And just so you understand the geography of the like Twin City area in Minnesota, it's basically two cities, St. Paul's and Minneapolis which are separated by the Mississippi River running between them. So the beginning of the Weepy Voiced Killer's crimes began on the 31st of December 1980 and a 20-year-old Karen Potak was out celebrating the new year at a club with her sisters. At 1am when the nightclub was closing, Karen's sisters realised that she wasn't there and they didn't really know where she was and Karen had actually left the club and she decided to walk the short distance home. She was obviously still drunk, she still had a drink in her hand as she was walking and she didn't have her coat on even though it was snowing outside. It was obviously really busy because it was New Year, everyone was out celebrating but she ended up walking down a side street and there was no one on it except this one car with a man inside and this man would have seen an opportunity of a young drunk freezing girl who he could get into his car by offering her a warm ride home and at 3 a.m. police would receive the first phone call. Karen had been bludgeoned across the head with a tire iron and left for dead outside of the Malbec manufacturing building. She had been found naked and beaten and her head had been cracked open so badly that you could actually see her brain. She was rushed straight into surgery and Karen actually survived this attack but because of the severity of the injuries to her brain, she had no memory of anything that happened. She couldn't give any information of the person who picked her up or anything that happened that night. And police actually categorized this crime as an attempted murder because she was beaten so badly. However, they had no leads because where the attack happened was completely deserted. She obviously didn't have any memory and the chance of getting DNA evidence back then was pretty slim so they didn't really have any leads to go off. The killer's next victim would be 18-year-old Kimberly Compton from a small town called Pepin. On July 3rd, 1981, five months after the attack on Karen, the police would receive this disturbing phone call. And police were actually able to trace this phone call to a payphone outside a bar, but by the time they got there, there was absolutely no one there. The man had claimed to have stabbed someone with an ice pick, but this time he didn't give any information of where the body could be found. However, the next day, a group of teenage boys would come across a horrible, horrible scene with a body as they were walking through a wooded area near an unfinished freeway just south of St. Paul's, and this body would be identified as Kimberly Compton. She had been stabbed 61 times times with an ice pick, mainly to the chest, and as well as that, they also saw that she was strangled with a shoelace. Two days later, the killer actually rang the police again to apologize for what he had done and that he would turn himself in, but obviously he never did that. Instead, he phoned police saying, I'll try not to kill anyone else. I don't know why I stabbed her. I'm so upset about it.
and he also called local media for a second time to apologize and also correct them on details they got wrong of the crime. And despite these multiple phone calls, police were still unable to identify the man. So Kimberly had only just arrived at St. Paul's the day she was murdered. Like I said, she was from a small town in Wisconsin and it had a population of less than 1,000 people. After graduating, like a lot of the younger people there, she decided she wanted to have a change and just wanted to start a new chapter of her life in Minnesota. So she got a bus to St. Paul's. When she arrived, she put her bags in a locker, decided she was hungry and went straight to the diner across the road. And just a couple of hours later, she was dead. The post-mortem of Kimberly's body showed that her last meal was beef and fries. This was really good information because she'd only been in St. Paul's for a couple of hours. No one knew her. No one could really give any information of her whereabouts that day and they managed to track her location back to the bus station because when they found her body there was a key to the locker for the bus station which is how they originally identified the body and they realized that the diner across the road from the bus station had a special of barbecue beef and chips the day that she died. So police were now able to try and at least get some information so they decided to interview the staff at the diner and I went through a number of sources half of them said that the people at the diner had no information while the other half said that they saw a man approach Kimberly and offer to show her around because she'd just arrived. Um, but either way, it led to nothing. It was a dead end anyway, which makes me think that the staff didn't actually see anything and they found out later when they convicted the killer, when he actually gave his statement. Despite numerous people calling in saying they recognized the voice and they had over a hundred tips on who people thought it could be, the case eventually went cold for nine months until they finally had their first suspect. Two months after Kimberly Compton's murder, a man called Alan Lopez actually murdered his whole family via shooting. He had killed his parents and sister and was taken to a state security hospital because he was diagnosed as being too mentally incompetent to stand trial. Police finally thought they had a chance at solving this case, but before they could even interview Lopez, he actually committed suicide just days after entering the hospital. However, back when he actually murdered his family, he ended up barricading himself into his own home and actually admitted that he killed Kimberly Compton. Police knew that whoever killed Kimberly Compton also attacked Karen Potak just because of the way the victims were attacked, how they looked, they looked very similar as well as the phone calls after the crime. So even though Lopez was dead, they still needed to look into him to link him to the crimes and actually solve the case. However, when they were looking into him, they discovered that there was no way Lopez could have attacked Karen because he was actually staying in a mental facility that night. But later, when they were looking back over him again, they found out that he had a day pass for the day that Karen was attacked. So he was a suspect, wasn't a suspect, and was a suspect again. But again, there was another twist. After they realized that he could have attacked Karen, they went on to try and link him to Kimberly's murder. And they found out that Lopez was actually in jail the day that Kimberly was murdered, so he couldn't have done that crime. And because they knew the two crimes were linked, if he didn't do one, he didn't do the other. So he was actually ruled out as a suspect. Police were now back to square one with no suspects and two cold cases. Now, I'm also going to add an anomaly in the case here because I didn't know whether to put it at the end or now, but I'm gonna go in chronological order so it's gonna fit here. So on the 21st of July, 1982, a 33-year-old woman named Kathleen Greening was scheduled to go on holiday with her friend Carol, but when Carol arrived the day they were supposed to leave to pick her up. She didn't get an answer at the door when she was knocking and like calling for her so she actually let herself in because the door was unlocked and she looked through the house for her friend and she found her dead in her bathtub from drowning. She was naked face up under the tap with her knees like bent towards the tub and police actually ruled this death as an accident but it wouldn't be until later that they were actually able to link it to the weepy voiced killer. But because he never tried to call the police or contact newspapers about the killing afterwards and it was also a different MO, this made it a outlier for the case and I never really read anywhere why the murderer did this. The fourth victim 
them would be a 40 year old nurse from the Minneapolis side of the river named Barbara Simmons. I'm gonna say Simmons because that's how I read it. It might be Simon, so if I'm wrong, sorry. Barbara was last seen on the 6th of August, 1982 at the Hexagon Bar dancing with a man that she'd earlier offered a cigarette to. And after spending the night at the bar, she went up to a waitress and said, he's cute, I hope he's nice since he's given me a ride home. The waitress thought this was a little bit weird to say, so she actually watched Barbara and the man leaving together. And later that evening, the killer would make his third phone call to the police. Barbara's body was found the next day by a newspaper carrier walking along the Mississippi River and she was stabbed to death by over 100 stab wounds. And it looks like the killer actually tried to get rid of the body this time by pushing her into the river but the body actually got caught on like shrubbery so it didn't really work and that's how her body was found. The police ended up tracking Barbara's movements back to the Hexagon bar and also the waitress that she spoke to that evening. The police showed the waitress over 100 photos of local felons hoping that she'd be able to identify the man that she saw Barbara leaving with that evening. She actually did pick one out of the man she saw leaving with her that evening. The man that she identified was named Paul Stephanie Stefani. He was a 37 year old janitor and he had a history of psychiatric problems and he also has an aggravated assault charge which he was convicted for. Police actually discovered that Stefani had been fired from the Malberg manufacturing plant just three years before the attack that was carried out on Karen in the same location and this now made Stefani the police's number one suspect and they decided to start a surveillance on him. Despite being under surveillance Stefani managed to lose the police that were following him and actually picked up a 19 year old prostitute named Denise Williams on August 21st 1982 in the Minneapolis red light district. When he was speaking to Denise the prostitute they worked out some sort of deal because he didn't have enough money that he would take her back to the home have sex and pay the rest of the money afterwards. After they'd finished, Stefani offered Denise a ride back to the district and she accepted. But instead of driving directly to where they were meant to, he decided to go down a dark secluded road, saying that it was a shortcut, which Denise obviously knew wasn't true. And she instantly became concerned when he drove down a dead end road. During this time in the car, she noticed a bottle on the floor and she thought to herself, if anything happens, I will pick up this bottle and start hitting him with it. And what happened is Stefani started to stab Denise with a screwdriver. He actually stabbed Denise a total of 15 times, but during this attack, she did manage to grab the bottle and hit him over the head with it. The glass broke and she started like stabbing him back, basically hitting him with the bottle, basically fighting for her life. And he did get loads of cuts on his faces. He was bleeding and she managed to open the door to the car, which she fell out of. He fell out on top of her, still stabbing her with this screwdriver and Denise decided to just scream as loud as she could, which did wake up a nearby resident who was sleeping with their window open. And this was a man called Douglas Panning. He comes out and basically tries to wrestle Stefani off of Denise. And this ends up leading to Stefani fleeing the scene. Douglas was able to call for an ambulance to treat Denise's 15 puncture wounds 
and she ended up going into surgery and actually survived as you would have seen from the videos that I did play of her earlier and after her surgery she was able to identify Stefani to the police. So Stefani had fleed at this point and he'd actually gone back to his apartment but when he got there he realized that from the wounds that Denise had actually like inflicted on him that he was actually bleeding quite profusely and decided to seek medical help and at this time when he rang emergency services it wasn't a phone call of admittance it was actually a plea for help. It would be this phone call that confirms Stefani as the weepy voice killer and links him to Denise's attack because police were able to connect the dots of the lost surveillance, the attack, the wounds and obviously the voice of the caller. So currently they haven't linked him to any of the other crimes apart from the fact that he has the same voice so they end up charging him for Denise Williams attempted murder. Police interviewed Stefani about the attack on Karen and the murders of Kimberly and Barbara. They showed him crime scene photos from all the attacks but all he said was you're not going to pin those on me and basically denied any connection to the weepy voiced killer. During the trial police just couldn't link Stefani to the weepy voiced killer even though his sister actually stood on the stand and said that the voice she heard on the tapes was her brother's voice. However after further investigation the police actually did manage to connect Stefani to Barbara's murder. Um, I couldn't actually find out how they linked it but they did. But because Karen and Kimberly's attack happened on the St Paul side of the river and not Minneapolis, the police couldn't charge Stefani for their murders even though they believed it was him. Because it was a different jurisdiction, even though they believed it was him, they couldn't be the one who actually did the charging. It had to be the St Paul's police. A jury did find Paul Stefani guilty for the attacks on Barbara. Barbara and Denise and he was sentenced to 40 years for Barbara's murder and 18 years for Denise's attack. And the police of St Paul's did believe that Stefani carried out the other two crimes on Kimberly and Karen but they didn't think it was necessary to charge him because he was already going to be spending the rest of his life behind bars anyway and they also didn't think that they had enough sufficient evidence to actually charge him for the murders. In the eyes of the law they didn't have enough evidence so they didn't take him to trial. And just 12 years into Paul Stefani's prison sentence he was diagnosed with terminal skin cancer in 1977 and given just one year to live which is when Stefani decided to confess to the murders of Karen Potak, Kimberly Compton and a third murder of Kathleen Greening which I mentioned earlier. I did mention this earlier but after finding out about his involvement with uh, Kathleen Greening they did find an address book of hers that had Stefani's number in it and Stefani was able to give information about Greening's death, her house and things that only the killer could really know so they confirmed that this was an anomaly of the case and he did kill her as well. Stefani told the police that he wanted to confess and apologize for the killings before he died saying I'd rather go to the grave knowing that this is all taken care of and off my chest 
Uh, to this day, I can't believe it. I wake up in the morning thinking and hoping I'm dreaming all this, but then I say, no, Paul, you're still in jail. I don't know what to do except say I wish I could turn back the clock. As the doctor said, just one year after his confession, Stefani died at the Oak Park Heights Maximum Security Prison. And that is the end to today's Who Done It Wednesday case. It was quite a horrible one. The While I was researching this and seeing the pictures, it wasn't very nice to look at and listening to the actual phone calls wasn't very nice either. I never know how to end these videos. Like, what do you say once you've just been talking about how people have died and been murdered? So... I'm just gonna leave the video here. I will just say that my next case is gonna be the Cannibal of Rottenburg. So if you are interested in that or want to listen to the story, make sure to subscribe to my channel because that'll be up next week and I will see you then. Bye.